morning grade eight. Right, carrying on with the structure of the cell, and this is our last week of online teaching because next week we'll be back face to face. I'm very excited. I hope you are too. Right, so carrying on with the structure of the cell. We were busy with the structure of the cell wall. So remember, I said to you that animal cells don't have a cell wall, but plant cells do. And so do a lot of microorganisms have a cell wall. Not all, but many of them. And I left off by saying that plant cell wall is made up of cellulose fibers. So it would be just like if you cut a whole lot of pieces of string and you spread them out and pile them up on top of each other on your desk, then that is what the cell wall would look like under a microscope. And so this was looking at a plant cell wall under an electron microscope, so it's really highly magnified. And then this little portion here was magnified at an even higher magnification over here. And I said to you that when um, you look at paper under a microscope, it looks exactly the same. And the reason why is paper is made from pulped wood. And so it's made from cellulose fibers. And so this is a micrograph of a piece of ripped paper. So it's not been cut, it's been ripped. And it's looking at it under a microscope. And what you can see here is um, this is the torn edge. But you can see if you looked over here at the top, that's exactly the same as this looks. Okay, and what you can see at the torn edges, you can see all the fibers of cellulose. Okay, so in comparison, there's a cellulose cell wall of a plant cell, and this is cellulose fibers in a piece of paper very highly magnified. So what are the functions of a cell wall? Cell wall has lots of different functions. First of all, it provides support. So it provides mechanical strength, that means physical strength, and it provides support. So you've got to remember that plants don't have a skeleton. Animals have a skeleton, most animals, either an exoskeleton or an endoskeleton as we do, or um, some animals have got what is called a hydrostatic skeleton. That means that they have water or a liquid in a cavity in their bodies that actually acts as, as an endoskeleton um, to provide support but you don't have to worry about that. So, um, when the cell is um, turgid, it's not a word you know, but anyway. So, the cytoplasm of the cell exerts pressure against the cell wall. Um, and that helps to keep the plant rigid and erect. And to explain this to you, um, I want you to think of a piece of lettuce. So a lettuce leaf. Let's say that you just picked a lettuce leaf um, from the garden and that lettuce was nice and well watered. And so that lettuce leaf is nice and firm. So that is because of the pressure of the cytoplasm in every cell Pressing, press, pressing against the cell wall in every cell. Now that would be an example of that. But then, let's say you used four out of the five lettuce leaves you picked in your salad that you made for yourself for lunch and you ate that salad and the fifth lettuce leaf you left on the kitchen sink and later on in the evening when you go back down to the kitchen, you see that the fifth lettuce leaf is all 
wilted and soft and soggy. And that would mean that each cell has lost a little bit of water from its cytoplasm and therefore the cytoplasm is no longer pushing against the cell wall and therefore that whole lettuce leaf is wilted and soft. And the way that you would fix it is you would put it into a bowl of water, not salt water, that'll make matters worse. You just put it into a bowl of water and if you go back about a half an hour later, every cell has absorbed some water and now the cytoplasm is pushing against the wall again. Anyway, that's beside the way. Then it also functions to protect from microorganisms. So the cell wall provides a barrier to protect against viruses or other little organisms that would be able to cause disease in that organism. And remember that organisms that cause disease are called pathogens, pathogens. So um, the tuberculosis bacterium is a pathogen because it causes diseases. Anyway, another function of the cell wall, and remember, because these are in blue, um, they are for interest only. So cell walls allow communication between one cell and the next. So in fact, there are tiny little pores in the cell walls between two plant cells. And strands of cytoplasm actually pass through um, from one cell to the next cell. And that allows molecules and communication signals to pass between neighboring plant cells. I see this should have been a lowercase p, I apologize. Um, all right, so to show you how that occurs, if you look here, what you will see is across the middle here, that's the cell wall, and it's in fact two cell walls, because the top part would be the cell wall of this cell, and the bottom part would be the cell wall of this cell. Okay, so here's one cell or part of one cell and here is part of the neighboring cell. And this little channel here is a pore in the cell wall between this cell and that cell. And a strand of cytoplasm passes through from this cell to that cell or vice versa. And this means that this cell up top here is able to communicate in different ways with this cell at the bottom here. It can either pass communication signals through or it can pass molecules to actually function as communication signals. Then in addition to that, another function of a plant cell wall is it helps to reduce water loss from the cell. That's terribly important in plants. If you remember back to the previous slide when I said to you, because plants don't have a skeleton, as most animals, many animals do, um, they've got nothing to help them remain rigid, or they've got different ways to help them remain rigid. And one of the ways is the water putting a pressure on the cytoplasm, putting a pressure on the cell wall. So water loss is a huge concern for plants. Okay, so cell walls are present in all plant cells. And in plant cells, they're made of cellulose. They may have an extra component added to them, but that's not the norm. And so we're just going to pretend that that doesn't occur. Okay, then there's fungi and the chemical from which the cell wall of a fungal um, cell is made is a chemical called chitin or chitin. I don't care how you pronounce it. It's the same chemical from which the skeleton of insects is made, which is very interesting. And then ba bacteria have the chemical peptoglycan. peptoglycan. And these are not found in animal cells because animal cells don't have cell walls. 
So it's considered the only non-living part of a cell and doesn't form part of the cytoplasm. It protects the cell, I said, from mechanical damage and main function supports and strengthens the cell. Now this again is in blue, so it's just for interest only. And what this shows you is it shows you what are called xylem vessels. And these are the plants that function like straws. They transport water and minerals throughout a plant. What happens is when they are first formed, they're just like normal cells. They've got cytoplasm, they've got cell walls, etc. And then as they mature, they differentiate and specialize. In other words, they're going to perform a special function, which is transporting water and minerals. And so their structure changes to enable them to perform that, that function. And what happens is um, the cell walls um, become thickened so they can withstand um, suction and then um, their cytoplasm disintegrates. And so xylem vessels are dead and they're hollow and they transport water and minerals throughout a plant. So this is an electron micrograph, very, very highly magnified. And what you're looking at is you're looking from the top down into the xylem vessel. So this would be like if you put a straw into your Coca-Cola and you were looking down the straw to see what it looked like inside, that's exactly what you're doing here looking down into a xylem vessel and in fact wood is made of xylem vessels so yep okay so that's the cell wall the next part of the, the cell that we're going to deal with is the cell membrane so the cytoplasm of both plant and animal cells is surrounded by a cell membrane so if you look at cytoplasm look at the drawing on the right side the very outermost layer of the cytoplasm is the cell membrane. Now it's exactly the same with the plant cell. Look at the plant cell. Okay. Here is cytoplasm. The outermost layer of the cytoplasm is the cell membrane. And then the plant cell has in addition to that a cell wall on the outside. But the cell wall is not part of the cytoplasm. So it's correct to say the cytoplasm of both plant and animal cells is surrounded by a cell membrane. So the cell membrane is the outermost layer of the cytoplasm. Remember, the cell wall is thick, so you draw it as two lines, and the label line goes to between those two lines. So if you were drawing a plant cell wall, a plant cell correctly, you would have from the outside inwards one line, two lines, label line between them, cell wall. On the inside of the second line would be a third line, and that is the cell membrane. Okay. The proper scientific name for a cell membrane is plasma lemma. Okay, you don't have to know that. So it's in blue. Why is a cell membrane important? So it is in terms of its properties, it is what is referred to as partially or selectively permeable. And that means only certain substances are able to pass through it. And because of that, the cell membrane controls what is able to go into and out of the cell. And that's terribly, terribly important for a cell. So partially or selectively permeable. The old term used to be semi-permeable, but that's now no longer a word that is used and that only allows certain substances to pass through it. Okay, so the cell membrane is a very, 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 very thin layer. In plant cells, I said the cell membrane lies on the inside of the cell wall. So if that's the cell wall there, and the cell membrane lies on the inside of the cell wall. In an animal cell, it's the outermost layer of the cell. 
So here you can see it's called a plasma membrane or a plasma lemma or a cell membrane. And it's the outermost layer of the cell. Okay. So this is very highly magnified with an electron microscope. And what this shows you is it shows two neighboring cells. So look where I'm moving the mouse. One cell would be over here and one cell would be over here. And what you can see is you can see the cell wall of each of the cells. Now watch carefully, I'm going to show you. The cell wall goes from here to there for that cell. I'm going to do it again. From here to there for this cell. And it's made up of a number of different layers. You don't have to worry about the layers, but what happens is as a cell gets older, it quite often adds layers to the inside of its cell wall. So its cell wall becomes thicker and thicker. Just like if you paint your house again and again and again, um, there would be layers of paint on the wall. Now it's exactly the same here. Cells add layers to the inside of their cell wall. So that's the one cell's cell wall. And the other cell's cell wall is from here to there. Okay. And you can see this very thin black line here and this very thin black line here. And that is the cell membrane of each of those cells. Now you can see why. I say you have to draw the cell wall as two lines. In other words, you would draw one line there and one line here, and the label line goes to between the two, whereas the cell membrane, being very thin, is drawn as a single line. Okay, now you don't have to know this, but I'm just telling you because you can see it so clearly here. This layer here, between the cell walls is something called a middle lamella and it is functions as a cement to hold plant cell walls together. So plant cells are held together by this layer of middle lamella. Animal cells aren't. They're easily moved apart from each other. Okay. So earlier on this year, we spoke about eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. And I said to you that eukaryotic cells contain membrane-bound organelles. Prokaryotic cells don't because they don't have any membranes in them other than a cell membrane. So an organelle is a specialized membrane-bound structure within a cell that performs a specific role. Okay, so it's a structure that is surrounded by a membrane and it has got a particular um, structure because it performs a particular function. Okay, and there are lots of organelles in cells, and we're only going to deal with a few of them. I'm not going to go through all of this now. Um, I'll go to each one of these different things and deal with it in a lot more detail. So examples of organelles are the nucleus of the cell, and the nucleus of the cell is that structure that controls the cell. Vacuoles in a cell. Vacuoles are very important in plant cells. Well, they're also important in animal cells, but they're much bigger in plant cells. And we'll talk about vacuoles, and you know what chloroplasts are. So chloroplasts are found in some plant cells, and we'll deal with those. So these are just some examples of organelles. So remember, an organelle is a specialized membrane-bound structure within a cell that performs a specific role. So first of all, let's deal with the nucleus of a cell. A nucleus of a eukaryotic cell is a membrane-bound organelle and it contains all of the chromosomes of the cell. You should know what a chromosome is by now. And a chromosome is made up of structures of little regions called genes. 
and you should know that a gene controls all the activities of a cell. So, a nucleus is normally spherical in shape. And here you can see a, an electron micrograph of a nucleus taken with a scanning electron microscope. So this structure here, this little spherical structure, is a nucleus. And it is surrounded by a nuclear membrane. So that's what you're looking at now. You're looking at what is called the nuclear membrane, the membrane that surrounds it. And in fact, the nuclear membrane is a double membrane. So if you drew it, you would draw it as two lines and label each one nuclear membrane. And you can see that there are tiny little holes in the nuclear membrane. And these are called nuclear pores. And these are terribly important because remember that the nucleus contains chromosomes made up of regions called genes and the genes control the activities of the cell. So what happens is the chromosomes within this nucleus will send out little messenger molecules through the little pores and those little messenger molecules go to regions of the cell and they will instruct regions of the cell what to do at any one time which is very cool to say the least okay so here is a micrograph an electron micrograph of an animal cell and this particular cell has got an incredibly big nucleus relative to the size of the cell so the nucleus here I've circled it in pale green to show you the nucleus, but now I'm going to show you with my mouse, my cursor. There's the nucleus. Okay, so everything inside that that whole structure is the nucleus. Um, and in this plant cell, um, this whole structure from here. Now, within a nucleus, there's normally one or more little spherical structures called a nucleolus. And you don't have to know about a nucleolus till later on um, in grade 10 and grade 12. So here's a nucleolus. Don't obsess. And you can't see a nucleolus in this nucleus. That doesn't mean there isn't one. But this particular section doesn't go through the nucleolus. What you can see here, if you look very carefully there, you can see that the membrane of the nucleus is double. Okay, and you can see it here. You can see that there are two lines. One, two. Okay. And then this is, you can see that this is a plant cell because look, there's the cell wall. Okay, and you can see that it's quite thick. No cell wall here. Okay, right, going. So just for interest only, so you and this is in blue, um, chromosomes are not normally visible in the nucleus. So there are chromosomes in every nucleus, but you can't actually see them. So if you look here, you can't see chromosomes. And here, you can't see chromosomes. And the reason why is because normally chromosomes are in the form of very, very long, very, very, very thin threads. And so if you look at this, this is um, a section under a light microscope, a section of some plant cells. And these are nuclei in their normal state. And you can see that you can't see chromosomes. But when a cell is about to divide, each of the chromosomes spirals. So it spirals and it spirals and it spirals again, and it becomes visible as a short, thick thread. And so when a cell is dividing, the chromosomes become visible as individual threads. 
And so in this micrograph, you can see two cells that are busy dividing at the moment. This is one. And look at the threads. These are chromosomes. Those are chromosomes. And here as well, these are chromosomes because the cell is also busy dividing. Okay. All right, so I think that that is enough for today. You must learn this work. Okay, I hope that you are all keeping up with learning the work. Because remember that when you get back to school, you're going to start by having um, some assessments very, very soon.